Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Dangerous Rhetoric. This is episode 83. We are almost at 100 episodes. I'm Brentley. I'm Dan. What's up? Um, and today we are joined by gay rights icon, legendary activist, uh, veteran police officer, Mr. Fred Sargent. Fred, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really are excited to talk to you about the origins of Pride. But before we jump in, Brad. Oh, but before we jump in, see, I wasn't glad I had you. Uh, don't forget uh, to like, subscribe, comment. Um, and if you want to financially support the show, there are donation links in the description, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. Give us your money. Give us your money. We love <laughs> to do this. And we are poor. So <laughs> all donations and uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, you, you don't make a whole lot talking about the stuff we talk about on here so it's dangerous rhetoric it's dangerous rhetoric. gets us in trouble but yeah i guess let's jump into this um fred thank you so much for joining us um i'm thinking we should probably start off with like fred's backstory before we jump into yes, the more fred. recent things that have happened which has you know led fred to be on the show in the first place so maybe start off with um you know taking us back in time a bit to how you got started um maybe your coming out story and then the whole gay rights movement and feel free to dispel any myths yes. about gay pride <laughs> about... history and all that stuff as you go through the story we're going to talk about that too for sure <laughs> yeah so you know kind <laughs> of a very very long pill if i have to dispel every myth <laughs> you can't dispel every myth yeah history well, is full just, of you know do your best it's fine we've got we've got you know two hours here if you if you need it but you know what's your story how did you get involved with all of that and you know and then we'll kind of lead it up to where we are today yeah uh, simply put uh, as a young man i did what many young gay people did i moved to an urban area uh, new york city and uh quickly became involved in, in gay rights activism uh, that was a much different time uh, most people who went into activism often did it under a pseudonym i always used my my real name uh, i quickly became friends and partners with uh, really one of the gay pioneers of the pre-Stonewall and post-Stonewall era, uh, Craig Rodwell. And uh, he, had, he had opened the first lesbian and gay bookshop in the world, the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, and I, I managed that for a time. And uh, we, were, we were headed uh, back home from a, a, a dinner party that we had been at earlier and we happened to be walking by um, the Stonewall. And it was just as people were being brought out by the police in the, the very initial parts of the raid. Wow. It, it, in fact, that's one of the myths. Uh, one of the uh, uh, British uh, gender news outlets frequently uses that quote for me to say that I was just passing by and had nothing really to do with Stonewall. And they had just claimed to have been there. Uh, in fact, I was there throughout that night, and I was there every night of the riots. Uh, we distributed leaflets, we organized, we uh, tried to bring people back uh, so that we could demonstrate uh, our, our ire at, at what the police had done that night and the, the existing situation having to do with um, police payoffs uh, that were received from bars. Uh, we, we learn later uh, more detail about that, but you know, it was simply put, it was to galvanize the gay community. And there were many other people as well, uh, but they were not the people that you hear today. Uh, they, they were not trans people. They were not drag queens that organized. It was lesbians and gay men that did that work. Some of them had been in the Mattachine Society and they went on to form the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, and these were all uh, compatriots and friends. After, after my period in New York, I, I moved back to Connecticut. I, I didn't really care for New York uh, as, as an environment and, and uh, moved to a smaller city, which is Stanford. And there I became a police officer. Now, it, it's important to note here that uh, uh, policing in an urban environment is, is a very political job. So I see myself as just having continued that uh, work that I had done in New York and uh, bringing what skills that I had and, and what interests that I had to policing. Some of that in, included nonviolent uh, policing uh, and uh, bringing 
uh, some new techniques to to the field. Uh, I had organized and, and um, uh, commanded the first hostage recovery unit in the state of Connecticut. Oh, cool. And did, did my training with um, uh, uh, Frank Bowles, who was a captain in the New York Police Department, and frequently went down there to meet and work with him. Uh, th so this was always something that I, I have been focused on in, in changing things for the better. I, I, I'm very proud of the fact that throughout my career, I never received a complaint or a personnel complaint from the public and that the units that I commanded had the lowest rate of such complaints. Uh, after, after retiring from the police department, I moved for a time to Provincetown and there I, I brought what skills I had developed both on the street in, in New York and, and uh, on the street in Stanford as a police officer uh, to um, municipal administration in Provincetown. I, I didn't run for political office, but I did serve on a number of, of, of boards and committee committees, primarily as, as a chairman, and worked on a number of issues, whether they were harbor regulations and trying to get control of environmental issues uh, in Provincetown to working on police issues, uh, bringing uh, community-oriented policing uh, to the town. Did we lose him? <clears throat> Fred, are you there? Uh -oh. He might have dropped out. I was about to come in here too. <laughs> what happened to you? Is it his end or our end? I don't know. It's still <laughs> recording on my end. I'm just going to let it go and I can edit this out if I have to. Let's see, maybe he'll rejoin. Uh, yep. Oh, there you are. Well, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, I can just pick up where I left off. It's, it's, all, right. Right. it's all good. No, no, it, the work in Provincetown included a, a lot of areas that had an, had an impact, whether it was streamlining um, the uh, uh, regulations, the ordinances in town, to uh, uh, proposing and, and uh, developing the, the first domestic partnership registry. Uh, Cambridge and, and Provincetown both kind of lay claim to who was first, but uh, we were both there together. And, uh, we set that up. And uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of in my work in Provincetown was again proposing and then uh, being part of the leadership of a committee to uh, develop a plan to uh, combat hate crimes in Provincetown. It was a little known at the time that Provincetown was one of the worst places in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, for hate crimes. And uh, so it became a, a topic that we needed to address. After that period, I, I kind of hung up my hat and retired to, to Vermont, where I, I lived quietly for a couple of decades uh, until 2019. In 2019, I was invited to an event in Paris uh, as, as being a French American and being someone who was at Stonewall. Uh, and, and uh, learned a lot there about how the story had changed about the, the, the narrative about Stonewall. And I, I was shocked by what I heard because I knew it was completely untrue and fabricated. So I came back here and uh, began reading and, and you know, going online, ordering books, contacting people. Uh, I contacted a number of transgender people, none of whom would speak to me. Uh, I did contact and reach out to gender critical groups, both here and in the, the UK. And uh, one of the first groups to help and, uh, was uh, the LGB Alliance in the UK. Uh, that had been recommended to me by a somewhat famous uh, uh, comedic writer, um, Graham Lenahan, uh, who uh, you may know Somebody as Glenner. Yeah, uh, he, he had recommended that I reach out to Bev and Kate at LGB Alliance, which I did. And uh, that, that's when I, I stepped into things in December of 2019. Uh, I, I like to point out that that's the same month that J.K. Rowling joined the fray. And, and yeah. uh, we've, we've kind of crossed paths since then, uh, most recently at the uh, during the aftermath of the event that I was involved in in, in Burlington Pride. So that, yeah, she, that's she, pretty she good. About 
Well, it's interesting too because it seems like the attack on you at the Burlington Pride got more play in the UK, in the UK media than it did here yes. in the US, which is yeah. like, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I guess because it's a smaller island and it's easier for stories to get around over there. Before we jump too much into the trans stuff, though, and all of that, I I kind of wanted to address. Um, the police topic really quick again um, and just I guess bring up one of the criticisms I've seen against you from the radical activist types and and it's the fact that you were a cop they criticize this they say well how could someone who was involved in Stonewall riots and saw how police were treating people like us go on and betray us and become a cop <laughs> totally dismissing the things that you just told us about you know trying to reform within the department and trying to less you know lessen hate crimes in provincetown and all these things they never seem to bring up those positive aspects your clean record right those things they just bring up well the fact that you are a cop automatically means that you are now part of the system that oppressed us which is such a black and white way of thinking about it those critics often say um, something along the lines that, uh, uh, you know, what did I do af after I became a cop? How many people did I beat up? Um, I mean, you know, it, it, of course, it's wholly made up like much of the, of the rest of their story and narrative. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the idea that police officers are, as a group, all violent and all... Uh, interested in oppressing others is is totally false. The vast majority of police officers do their job well. They, they do it consistently. They do it fairly. And they try to help. That's that's why most people become police officers. You know, we can we can go to the bad apple discussion. Uh, you know, we've all heard that before. But that's true of every profession. It is. And, it is true. Are, you, uh, are you familiar with Frank Serpico? Yes, he was one of the people that I admired back then. Uh, and I should say this, I didn't just decide to join the police. I, I was recruited by an officer, yeah. a, a black officer who knew me uh, personally, and he knew my politics. And he felt that I would be uh, an addition to the police department. And he eventually went on to become deputy chief of the department. So, so you know, yeah. policing has has many aspects to it. And uh, un un unfortunately, people focus only on the very bad and and rarely look at the good. Well, this, uh, this is why I bring up Frank, you know, because he, he was one of these people who really tried his best to reform the bad, to, you know, weed it out of the department to make the police, you know, a safer, more, you know, respectable profession and you know he got betrayed by some of those bad cops for doing it i also bring him up because he's a relative of mine he was my grandmother's mm -hmm. second or third cousin so my Ooh. italian line is the serpico line so that whole like resistance thing i think is sort of in my blood a bit but he didn't yeah. fit into the police you know he was kind of a hippie he liked to dress up in disguises he he hung out with people on the street and he 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 uh, sympathized with with black folks. He sympathized with gay folks, and at the time, that was kind of taboo, you know, in the seventies. You know, similarly, Frank had a problem with people who were on the take, uh, yeah. people who looked for breaks and bargains. Yep. I, I had the same problem. Uh, it happened on more than one occasion when I would have to tell a fellow officer, "You and I are not going to work together if yeah. you're going to demand a discount on your meal." I mean, you know, those are small things. But did, they, did, you they go offered, did you ever get offered money or the sorts of thing like graft money, like what was happening to him? No, no you, you also develop a reputation and, and people know who not to make the offers to. Yeah, that was what happened. That yeah. was what happened to him. Yeah. Things I had to deal with. They started, you know, to suspect him. They're like, well, he's not taking money. And then, you know, the fact that he wouldn't take the money automatically made him suspicious to the corrupt cops. That's but, right. you know, he's just, he's a good example that there, there are good cops and they get into it for the reason that you explained. You know, Frank got into it because he wanted to like be a superhero. He viewed cops as people who helped and saved others. And that was his whole intention of getting involved. So when he did join the force and he started to see the corruption there, it shocked him, I think, a bit at first because he was like, wow, this, you know, the, here's a profession that's supposed to be like superheroes, or at least that's how he viewed them growing up. 
and he was kind of disillusioned by the police force in many ways. Yes, I, I, I'd come into policing while that was still a problem where where I worked, and, and you know, one officer, he was notorious for um, taking things, and his yeah. nickname was Seagull. And <laughs> if, you can probably, you know, connect why he was called that. I mean, if my, there was something to be taken, my, he would land. <laughs> All right, so I guess we we can move now into I guess the meat well, and potatoes. Let me hold on, the, real quick, Fred. Were you were you out as a cop? And uh, it's a good so, question. Like, where where along your timeline did that happen? Was that after you retired? Before you retired? Well, like, it's a good question. People in the department knew that I was gay. Um, the, times were very different then right. as opposed to now. Um, the the uh, the officers then. Uh, really were individuals, uh, you, you, you kind of stood on your own. I used to like to work alone, uh, simply be, simply yeah. not because I, I didn't trust a fellow officer, but uh, for me, it was always safer for me if I didn't have to be looking over my shoulder to protect somebody else that I was working with. So I used to like to take on things on my own. Uh, and, and that indiv individuality uh, had, had um, an impact on how much I would discuss with people about my private life. Uh, and, and the same with the other officers. You really knew a whole lot about a, another officer um, as far as the private life went. Uh, you knew them as a colleague. Yeah, it seems to be one of the things that's changed a lot over the years yeah. is that we've gotten a lot more uh, expositive about our personal lives than we you know previous yeah. generations you know, now it's like this generation you know where everything's online yeah. you know and like you have to be out yeah. everywhere at your at your job all that stuff mm -hmm. loud and proud that's cool I had, no. with, I had a meeting with a prosecutor once and i went with a group of activists from provincetown and uh they they as we sat down for the meeting of course i'm familiar with how prosecutors usually work and and uh as we sat down for the meeting, one of the people in the in the group uh, started to do a check-in, and I knew immediately that this was not going to go uh, exactly as they thought it might. And the prosecutor very succinctly said, "Listen, I don't care about your life. We're here to meet about such and such." So, it's there are a lot of little stories like that that I could tell you. But yeah, now I bet. Um, so do you want to fast forward? Yeah, let's jump into the trans issues. Let's go back to 2019 when you sort of got back into activism and yeah, all of the, all of the recent stuff that, that has played out in, in Vermont and such. Is, what really was the first thing that like caught your attention that the TQ plus is now becoming sort of the dominant feature of the you know gay community i like to call it the gay community i won't even use the acronym anymore yeah. because i won't i don't like using their language well i guess it would be his trip to paris right when you realized that the narrative was being right shifted it, it, there was that learning period afterward and then in the fall of 2019 i, I as i said i had made contact with a number of people uh, more often in the uk uh, I, I see the uk as being the front lines of this battle um, yeah. It's very apparent from the, the news coverage. Um, and when I when I spoke to the, the heads of LGB Alliance, uh, Kate Harris and Bev Jackson, I, I said that what I had learned over the previous months uh, was that the, the, the transgender movement was extremely misogynistic and quite homophobic. Those were the things that jumped out at me. You know, there, there are other things that we can talk about, the, the philosophy of their arguments and, and so much more, but but uh, those are the two primary things, and those are the things that that move me towards LGB Alliance because LGB Alliance focuses on same-sex oriented people first, and they do discuss the other issues, but their primary concern is serving the the uh, same-sex oriented community, uh, which is why they be became a charity in the UK. Uh, and there, there's been a controversy over that because yeah. uh, gender outfits have challenged their charity status. No charity has ever challenged the charity status of another charity in the UK until that happened. Wow. Uh, the, 
these are these are despicable people, um, and I, I can't emphasize that more strongly. Yeah, it seems like there's this like pathological forced teaming going on, right? It's like okay, so now there's this. You know, LGB Alliance wants to you know focus on lesbians, gays, and bisexuals. Focus exclusively on same-sex attraction. You know, there's plenty of interest in you know protecting trans people, transgender rights. There's plenty of organizations that are focused on them, and a lot of them used to be you know more on the, the mission of focused on homosexuals and homosexual issues. So I don't see any problem with having an organization that goes back to that original. Let's you know focus on homosexuals, homosexual youth homosexual issues sex based rights and yeah and let's like you know anybody that wants to focus on transgenderism or non-binary politics you know you can do that like i don't understand why people can't just have their own little thing but right. this is it they're pathological really they have almost a obsessive compulsive nature to attack anyone that sort of steps outside of their you know ideological framework which is why i keep saying that they're in a cult well, so this goes back to this hijacking of the narrative, meaning the history of gay rights. And I think that's that's kind of what this is, right? It's like they really are trying to latch on to the movement and not just latch on to it, but even to like insert themselves in the beginning of it as if they were this, the, the main driving force that gave all of us our rights and led to, you know, gay, lesbians, yeah, and bi. Yeah, rewriting history right. in real time. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about Marsha P. Johnson, because Marsha P. Johnson is commonly one of these people who's brought up. Yeah, let's like, pop that balloon. And I'm bringing up Marsha because, um, <laughs> you know, me, me and Marsha are from the same city. I am also from Elizabeth, New Jersey. And I always found that interesting. I believe Marsha's family is still there, too. I saw an interesting documentary on him. And there's this misconception that Marsha was trans. Marsha never identified as trans. There's video footage of Marsha very clearly stating that he's a man <laughs> who cross dresses, right? So even, even Marsha's narrative has been hijacked and changed itself. You know? And Marsha's own identity has been sort of warped by these people changing the history. They say Marsha was the, the first black woman who like threw the brick in the window. I've seen this. People say that that Marsha was the first one who started the riot. She's that's throwing, not true. She's throwing her heels at the you know at the I'm night. It's just not. Pretty sure that's not true. You know, Maybe Fred, Fred, you can let us know. What, what do you know it's about like, Miss Marsha? It's tragic the way the way the way he died is tragic and all of that. But the way he's like held up as like the this icon, the, this icon I don't think that status is deserved in the way it's deserved. Well, Fred was well, there. The, 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 on, the online narrative about um, Malcolm Michaels that you call Marsha P. Johnson uh, is, is made up. And um, it, people needn't take my word for it. I, I would ask that they simply read the histories that are written by historians, Eric Marcus, David Carter, um, Martin Duberman. Um, these people have long ago dispelled the myth of Marsha Johnson. Marsha Johnson was not there. Um, Marsha Johnson admitted after after telling a series of lies about his participation, um, it, it finally admitted that he, he didn't arrive until after the, the, the door of the bar was already on fire. And that didn't happen right away. That uh, when, when the disturbance occurred in front of the, the bar, there was a lot of throwing of coins and stones and that sort of thing. And somebody went across Sheridan Square uh, I, I believe that the shop is still there. There's a cigar stand, and uh, it, they they got a bottle of, of uh, lighter fluid, and then they came back and you know squirted it all over the door, and that's how the door caught fire briefly. Uh, and uh, Marsha apparently arrived then. That was maybe an hour into the riot, and uh, uh, I did see Marsha. Uh, Craig had also seen Marsha. Marsha had climbed up onto a, a, a telephone pole. They used to have, I don't know what they're like now, but they used to have stanchions at the base. Yeah. And had climbed up onto the stanchion after grabbing a bag of soggy garbage, which was a lot of people who lived in apartments and didn't have garbage disposal, used to drop them in the baskets on the street and grabbed a bag of soggy garbage and dropped it onto the, the windshield of an empty police car. <laughs> which I found not brave nor inspiring. Um, uh, and, and something I frequently say is that they, they were, we didn't follow 
uh, drug addled drag queens any more than somebody today would follow some hillbilly heroin addict uh, who happened to find themselves at, a, at an event. It, it just didn't happen any more than it would today. Uh, I understand that, and this is well after I left New York, that um, Malcolm became involved in, in other issues and other groups. But the, the, the common thread throughout what he did was a grift. It was about making money off of what you could get at. Uh, it, it, that was part of his involvement with GLF. Uh, GLF was made up of what were called cells back then. You know, it's very, very radical to, to form a cell within a larger liberation group. And uh, he, he formed a cell of drag queens. Uh, it was called Star. And many people are told that STAR was this housing agency uh, for homeless LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, that was not what it was. What it was was a squatted apartment on 2nd Street in the East Village. Uh, they were able to stay there for about eight months without utilities until the mob owner of the building got out of jail and came back and threw them out. It, wow. In order to stay at the flop apartment, you needed to be a sex worker, you needed to d deliver, and that's where you could do your drugs. I, I a few years back, I, I checked with the city uh, records uh, regarding uh, STAR. They never registered as a charity. They never re registered as a nonprofit. It was simply a cell in GLF, and it's been made into this, this large uh, philanthropic organization. Uh, and again, it's just another story. Hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> oh, God. You know, hearing this, it makes you wonder, like, how much of our mainstream history is like this, yeah. right? Because if we're hearing about little incidents here and there, you know, just niche gay history, you know, it, it's not even that big of a deal. But when you see these little alterations being made, you have to wonder, like... Yeah. History at large, like, how much how of it, much of it is, <laughs> like, has been like this. But. And it occurs, it, it occurs be, because of uh, the well-meaning activities of other people. One of the people that I knew uh, who was very involved at that time and did, as an individual, help a lot of gay street youth, um, he went to David Carter and asked David Carter in his book Stonewall to focus more on Marsha Johnson because he knew uh, Johnson and, and uh, was a friend of his. He was one of the people that was instrumental in uh, getting Johnson his social security for his mental disability. Um, Carter refused. Carter was a historian. Uh, he's, he's since passed, but uh, he refused to alter the story because he wanted to tell the true story. And uh, th there were, there's always been that, that influence from outside of people wanting to uh, insert the narrative into the history. Uh, Eric Marcus does a very good job of, of not opposing the narrative so much as just putting the facts out there consistently. Good. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, I'm looking up some books right now. Yeah, Daniel's getting all the books. <laughs> yeah, I'm the book nerd, so I'm so like, I'm gotta like, read this, gotta read this. I have to make notes. You should actually keep keep a, like, a little tab, and I will put the links to the Amazon pages in the description. So Word. That was one of the things one of the commenters asked, because we talk about books a lot. Yeah, so I got, whenever we talk about books, I have to remember to David put Carter, I got links Eric, to the books. Eric Marcus. There was another name you mentioned that I think I missed. There's a third one. Uh, Martin Duberman. Martin Duberman. Martin Duberman. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, yeah. I love books. So then bring me to, uh, should we, uh, is there anything else we need to talk to before we talk about Burlington Get, get into the modern stuff. Um, no, I think, I you mean, I've laid the groundwork here. I think we can't, like, you know, like Fred said earlier, we, we can't really, like, address every single historical myth about sure what happened back then but i think marcia is just a good example a good really clear example of how the narrative can be shifted and someone's story can be completely transformed and become like a myth like a legend almost. before we before we jump to the attack on fred fred tell me how do you feel about rupaul's drag race <laughs> and like other like shows I've like never, queer act the gay guy or queer i've act never seen it. i've never yeah. seen either really uh, i've seen a couple of clips out of yes. queer eye but 
uh, it's programming that that, that I don't relate to. Uh, I've never yes. I've never been a fan of drag. I've always thought it was a stereotypical um, expression about a negative expression about women and not something that I ever could support. I went to one drag performance um, in Provincetown uh, on the recommendation of a friend who knew that I opposed drag. And he said, no, you've got to see Randy Allen. Uh, Randy Allen had a show at the time called um, P.S. Betty David, meaning post-stroke Betty David, uh, Betty Davis rather. And right. uh, I, I didn't like it. Um, I, it, it was consistent with everything I've ever said and thought about drag. So uh, I, I can't tell you a lot about drag. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I feel like these mainstream programs that sort of commercialize homosexual or aspects of homosexual culture, gay culture, uh, do aren't good for the community and they aren't good for the larger culture because what they're doing is they're not really, I mean, they, they, they claim to be like bringing culture to people, but really what they're not doing that. They're taking this like slice of it, of really what is nightlife culture. Yeah. And then they're just putting it on blast as if it's gay when it's just, you know, a slice of how gay people entertain themselves at bars. Yeah, now it's more than a slice. It's become like a forefront. Of it blows my mind. Yeah. They, got, like, they got the Queens, like, reading stories to children now and i'm just like they have them going into public schools yeah, and i'm just like this is not the people that we want as the, yeah. <laughs> the representatives of our community mm -hmm. going out and interacting with children i'm just like uh so i guess that frustrates you similarly yeah i'm i think i'm frozen here oh yeah it looks like your video Fred is frozen, frozen. still got you it'll mm -hmm. come back you still have second. your sound now so you can hear us okay good uh, there's a connection to that in, in the event that occurred. Uh, the uh, Burlington Pride event is put on by an organization called the Pride Center of Vermont. And uh, one of the people that is uh, a central figure in organizing Pride is a drag queen um, whose drag name is Emoji Nightmare. And uh, he does a drag queen story time uh, in, in you know, the Vermont area. And it uh, uh, was a controversy this year over his uh, appearing in a small town at their library um, in Chester, Vermont. Uh, the, uh, the, in, in fact, the director of the library uh, resigned because the library um, uh, directors, uh, or, or rather the board, uh, ha had seen his website. And on his website, uh, he had a, a depiction of a woman that's associated with a record that he was doing. And uh, she was, the woman was naked, uh, was dripping with bodily fluids. Oh, my. And her, and her head was in the shape of a dumpster. So the, the, the board felt that this was not somebody that they were going to support uh, as, as being suitable for children. And um, when he was... When he was asked by the, the local press uh, about what the board had decided, he said, well, I don't know any six-year-old that's uh, going to my website, but if they are, more power to them. What? God. Gross. So yeah. weird. So strange. These people, they don't, it's like there's no boundaries. There's no, you know, well, self-awareness. I, I think that's the point. I think they want that's the problem. They want to dissolve all the boundaries. They yes, and that's that's the that, that's the the foundation of queer theory, to dissolve all of the boundaries and to remake society, uh, and, and somehow our organizations have been tagged with that. And it's one of the things that I say needs to go. I mean, the, I, I've equated it to being a divorce. The 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 TQ part of our family is really uh, more more you could say more closely resembles an abusive spouse. And as we all know, um, in, a, in an abusive relationship, they, they really don't hold together. And the, the abuse party, the, the, the LGBs, they need to say no to this and, and affect a divorce. Well, what they, what they need to realize is that there's projection happening from the radical types on the, the TQ side when they're saying 
you're erasing us by not using our pronouns, by not affirming us, by not yeah, finding us, by not finding us sexually attractive and things like that. And it's like, well, it's actually the opposite. You're erasing us by erasing the idea of sex in general, that there's sex-based rights, that, that we have a sex-based attraction. Like, I'm a homosexual male. I'm attracted to males. Even if you appear male from the top up, if from the bottom down, you don't have the rest of the anatomy, I'm sorry, I'm just not attracted to you. That's my experience. So to be called like a bigot, to be called a transphobe for stating something as simple as, as that, that we can have sex-based attraction, it's literally erasing us. It's literally like the opposite of gay rights. It's homophobia. It's a new form of it. Our, our organizations have been co-opted by this. And uh, the, the Burlington Pride Center is a, is a very good example of that. If you yeah. go to their website, you will not find one man there that identifies as gay. I mean, you'll find their pronouns um, and that sort of thing. If you look at their education page, uh, they say that the, the, the use of the term gay, is, gay is, an, is a term of erasure. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're clearly coming down on the side of erasing gay from the LGBTQ plus. Uh, yeah. and, and, and that's part of why I, I went to the, the Pride March this year, as well as last year. Uh, last year, I brought my first sign and it said, gay, not queer. Um, and didn't get much of a reaction. It was my sign this year that seemed to provoke a, a larger response. And that sign was a circle with a red line through it and the words blackface, woman face. Oof. And they became apoplectic when they saw the sign. Ooh, good word to use. <laughs> Oof, you want to pull up some of that stuff, Brent, maybe? Do you have any of that footage? Uh, yeah, I got, well, I don't know if, I don't have the footage necessarily, but I do have this iconic image, which I yeah. thought was really just so emblematic it, of the event because it's, it kind of, yeah, it, it's symbolic. It symbolizes it's where you, we like, on the ground yeah, after yeah. you've been attacked, surrounded by all these trans flags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me give you a little context to that. When they knocked me to the ground, that's when they, they surrounded me with flags to prevent the crowd from, from seeing me. As you can see, I've got uh, uh, brownish or beige fluids on my shoulder. That's from the coffee that they poured on the back of my head from behind. Uh, so the, their, their attack had been um, continuous. And uh, eventually when they couldn't get me to put my signs down, they knocked me down. Yeah, that's it's absurd. ridiculous. I mean, and you're, you're 74, right? And these are all probably individuals in their 20s and 30s. Yeah, uh, if, if that. Yeah, this was, so this is the only really fair article I found of the event. It was in Daily Mail, yeah, which is well, a UK publication. Well, like he said, the UK are the ones who really seem to be kind of fighting this more. Yeah, well, I, we'll go through. I want to compare and contrast here. So this is Daily Mail. Uh, headline, veteran gay rights protester 74 who was at 1969 Stonewall riots is attacked by pro-trans mob at Pride event for sign dismissing transgenderism as uh, woman face in single quotes. And then it goes on to give the summary. Um, and it basically just, you know, it says that you went down there with the sign, uh, and it describes the side with a red line through the phrases "woman face" and "woman face" and "black face" at the 39th Burlington Pride Parade in Vermont. Um, yeah, it says Sergeant is against a uh, gender ideology movement, which he says is homophobic and exclusive, which it is. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Also, Fred, you could try turning your camera on and back off with the buttons maybe at the bottom, so that, that unfreezes it. Um, mugged at the Burlington Pride Parade, Sergeant wrote on Facebook. So I went to protest their misogyny, homophobia, exclusionary policies, and divisiveness. I was met by screaming, multiple assaults, ageist comments, shoving slaps to the back of my head, pouring coffee on me, and repeated attempts to steal my signs. Being unsuccessful in their attempts to disrupt my protest and drive me away, the mob pushed me to the ground as the parade ended, further injuring me. And I guess that's uh, what the picture we saw. Oh, you were on the ground. And they stole over $500 worth of your property. Uh, and here we have this wonderful blue-haired fella. <laughs> I've, 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 I've called him in the press, uh, as I called him to his face, I, I had said to him, you know, you're not really the catch of the day. 
<laughs> she and certainly I think you would be it there too. Yeah, no, I mean this is it's just and here you can see the sign. I mean the sign is really good. I like it because it says, you know, we aren't to parody black people the same way we aren't to parody or caricature women. And they don't like that. They really because they, they're very anti blackface. So to to throw that inherent contradiction into their into their face, it really just it bubbles up the cognitive dissonance, and all that comes out is this like like they just get crazy. <laughs> um, which is why it's good that when you do this, you shouldn't be alone. <laughs> we should have more people with you in the future. Well, I I, I actually thought it was important to uh, be the one voice there. Uh, I uh, and I had asked people to stay, stand back uh -huh. and and not to get involved if there was a confrontation and and they respected my wishes again it's it goes back to my my old policing days I I, I tended to want to not have to worry about the people behind me and just stay focused on the, the adversary makes sense makes sense very self sacrificing very heroic of you good sir yeah it's just it's just crazy too because I'm sure some of these young folks are actual like gays and lesbians. Maybe they're just confused, but they really have no idea. It seems like they it's have a lot of no fear. idea the shit you went through and others of your generation went through to even have a society where we can like debate these things I mean, in the open in this Fred, way. You know, would you, would you say that the people that attacked you were they all like either biological females or biological males who identify as women? <laughs> Uh, biological males who identify as women. The the person that you have up now um, on the right, man. Uh, yeah. one one help. follower has uh, actually been able to identify him, and uh, that information is being passed along to the police. He was one of the people that knocked me to the ground. Yeah, that was my other question for you. Was uh, you intend to file charges? I mean, this is clearly they assaulted you. You were assaulted on the street. Uh, yeah, should they be identified, I will, I will file those charges. The person on the left, uh, that was the person, uh, as you can see, he's pushing against my sign. Uh, right. and he was one of the people that made ageist comments. He asked me, um, how is my pacemaker going? Oh, I, I wow. don't have a pacemaker. Uh, and he said to me, are you having a heart attack yet, old man? Wow. These vicious are man. friggin' evil. Vicious, vicious. Like literally, like wishing death upon somebody because you have a different political opinion. It's just like this is really where we're at. It's in, it's insane. These people are just so vicious, and this is why it's important that they there's that we have folks to stand up against them, and and we show this stuff, you know, and we talk about it because this is actually happening. A lot of people, you know, people. I went to the Boston Children's Hospital with the word Chris. Uh, not this past, not this weekend, obviously, but the last weekend. And um, so a lot of people there really had no, like one of the, the pro-transing of the children protesters really have no idea objectively what's going on, uh, the procedures that are being done, how many kids are being uh, sterilized or having healthy tissue removed. They just seem very ignorant. So that's why these kind of conversations are, are important just to bring more awareness to the situation. They have so many good clips here. And then it looks like Mr. Chris Felker came in here and tried to uh, interrupt or slow down the process. Well, he, he was yeah. asking them, like, what do they think they're doing? Like, yeah. why are you attacking this whole guy? <laughs> like, yeah, for folks who don't know, Chris Felker is the, uh, he's the head, basically, uh, Republican in the state of Vermont. He does not hold office, but maybe one day. Um, and he's uh, he was here just taking pictures and video. And uh, he, I saw his video, too. Um, they had, Josh had a bit of it on uh, his the disaffected program. Well, this is important too because I think it highlights another good point here, and it's this misconception that like all Republicans are these sign. evil, intolerant, homophobic, racists, devils, you know. And it's <laughs> like, bitch. and it's like here we have a, a Republican protecting uh, an elderly gay man from a mob. Yes, and, and, and and Chris, I met maybe a year ago or so. And uh, we've we've spoken a bit, and it's it's an interesting um, intersection. Uh, Chris, of course, is Republican chairman, uh, and I, I've 
I'm one of those people. I, I would describe myself as center left. Um, I, I've been yeah. voting for Bernie uh, for longer than most of my attackers have been alive. <laughs> uh, Funny. Yeah. So it, it's interesting that that Chris and I, while on many uh, policy issues, we might disagree. Uh, we we coincide here, and so we we're, we're working with our commonalities. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Daniel and I both are very standard center left. I've become more conservative as I've aged. Same. I'm 39, about to be 40. Daniel's 32. Um, but yeah, as, as we've gotten a little older, we've gotten a little bit more conservative. Uh, me more so with like the border and abortion, just because these seem to be the things that the left keeps going like cuckoo bananas town on. Like they, with the border, they just don't want one anymore. And with abortion, they want you able to, you know, they want you to be able to basically murder your your born child uh, up to like you know weeks after the fact. And I was just like, nope, 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 no more. Yeah. I don't really, I don't really fit in anywhere politically. That's kind of how I feel. Well, like, I like I'm not, I'm not conservative enough for the conservatives and not liberal or woke enough for the. That, that is an example of the diversity of opinion that really does exist in the LGB community. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we would probably disagree on a few of those issues. And that's okay. <laughs> right? Um, I just not have to believe as I do. I don't have to believe as you do. But that's not the way the two key uh, TQ uh, portion of our, our community um, wants to handle it. They want conformity. They want adherence. And I'm here to say no. And we're thankful for that. I just had to mute it here a little yeah. bit. We had, the, <laughs> we had background. sirens going by. And this woman here, she pushed you to the ground too, right? Oh, yeah. She was the one uh, trying to grab well, I, you. Know, I got knocked a bit off my feet. Uh, she was trying to steal my sign. She is the person who poured the coffee on my head. I learned That's later awesome. there's, there's some video about that. Um, and of course, we, we do want to see her identified and prosecuted. Yeah. And you think with, you know, this being the digital age, with this clear of an image of her face, it's only yeah, it's a matter like, of how, time. How has nothing happened to these people yet? It's crazy. It's like, well, you got to give the police a little time to do their work. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like they're... I'm sure they'll get around to it. There definitely seems well, to be a general again, kind of again, environment. Uh, again, uh, again, Burlington is an environment that... that, that uh, has contributed to these problems. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a defund movement in uh, Burlington led by the progressives, and uh, they were successful. Uh, the, the staffing was reduced, but it was reduced uh, with, with such rancor that many officers opted to retire or take their skills elsewhere in Vermont and become police officers in, in communities that had greater appreciation for the sacrifice that most police officers make. Um, and now Burlington is well under the number that they were looking to att attrition to. Um, and they're having trouble hiring because clearly if you're, if you're looking for a career in policing, what would possess you to go to Burlington? <laughs> right, <laughs> especially, you know, now it's like any cops are just looking to get out of deep blue areas um, and then there was this article, which I thought was really funny, from the Philadelphia Gay News. Fred Sargent was wrong, but so were his assaulters. I'm like, no, yeah, Fred was fine. Fred was wrong with Fred. <laughs> well, this you is notice how they said but, you know, but with regards to the assaulters. <laughs> what you didn't see in that article was the person who wrote it did not disclose his conflict in writing an article about me. Earlier this summer, I had... I put up a piece on, on Facebook regarding his partner, his husband. And his husband was in the UK. And one of the people that I criticized him for associating with was a, a guy named Peter uh, Tatchell. And uh, Peter Tatchell has a, has a long history in the UK. And uh, sadly, part of it is affiliated with pedophilia. Oh, and yeah. uh, and uh, Peter eulogized uh, one of the leaders or the founder, I believe, of an organization called PI, the Pedophile Information Exchange. And uh, Peter has written that not all um, uh, adult young person sex is necessarily bad. So 
I, I criticized his husband for associating with such a person on this, this uh, tour that he made of, of um, uh, Great Britain. In, in fact, a number of people who follow me in Great Britain, they asked, who is this guy? So I told them. And, uh, wow. So <laughs> the, the people who wrote this piece didn't disclose that there's quite a bit of animus that right. motivated yeah, this guy thing. has a personal axe to grind yeah. because you pointed out that his husband it was lionizing, you know, a guy who was apologizing for pedophilia. So that that's a pretty yeah, but, obvious conflict of interest. Yeah, but it, it, the, 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 the LGBTQ press is not known for their adherence to ethics. Imagine that, right? <laughs> Just imagine that, like, God forbid we had journalistic standards. And that was it. Those are the only two articles I found. I put your name into the news search on Google to see what came up. And those were it. And I was those just like, the only wow. Things. Yeah, well, look, there's hey. One, they, they, they there's one from the National Review. There's uh, one. They, did a piece. they the were National. like the first piece. That was uh, National Review. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to pull that up, and too. I think the Daily Caller, uh, you'll notice that these are conservative outlets that are uh, the, the Daily Mail is considered to be somewhat conservative in the UK. Yeah, it's a little insane. Um, so, Fred, tell me now that we've we've had this experience. Hopefully, they get some of these people and we can push charges. But what do you think? Uh, what are you, do you have plans to do this in the future? Like you, uh, how do you think that we as a gay community should respond to the TQ plus uh, invasion? As, as individual men and as a community? Well, a, a, a number of, well, uh, Chris Felker for one, uh, and a number of other uh, Burlington residents have invited me to a, a, a demonstration that they'll be holding on Saturday. Uh, and, and there they'll be confronting uh, the group that uh, the first attackers came from, a group called Outright Vermont. Outright Vermont formally did some very good work, but at this point, they're really just cultivating gang uh, violence on the streets of Burlington. And that's something that needs to be addressed. addressed. And that's why uh, these group of people have invited me to go and speak. Yes, and I will be there as well. I can't wait to see you speak in front of these people. And we're going to get a lot of good video reactions. And I'll be here with the dog. Daniel will be moderating the chat <laughs> and taking care of Radar. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a public speaker, really. Uh, in, in fact, um, despite my connections to history and such, I, I did very little in, in terms of, of communicating any of that. Uh, I um, norm, normally I decline to do interviews for books and such. Uh, I, I've done a few uh, recently. Um, I, I did have mm -hmm. some commissioned pieces the New York Times and the Village Voice that I did. But basically, I've, I've kind of been a private person. Uh, it, it's been at this stage in my life that I've been stepping out because I, I feel my voice can assist. Yeah, and that's uh, something you know, with us, we felt sort of called to make a show, to get out there and speak as gay people, because we similarly saw what was happening with you know, drag culture being pushed onto children, with the transgender ideology and you know gay uh, LGBTQ and gay rights being used as an excuse to indoctrinate very very young children, uh, these are things that you know Daniel and I are very concerned about, and we some really felt the need we had to get out there and start speaking because we wanted the world and and more Americans and other gay people to know that you know gay people have these opinions, and you know even though that some of these ideas can be considered like dangerous rhetoric that you know it's important to have the discussion to get the ideas out there to have the debate to disagree and to conflict and we to just, resolve those things over time we saw so much craziness and we knew that it was going to reflect badly back on on all of us as a whole and we realized that there was a there was a kind of a place there for voices like ours to step in and we were needed you know and i think that's kind of what it is it's like the universe called us and said well we kind of need people like you to step in right now and show others and say well hey look we're not a monolith 
Not all gay people think the same. Not all gay people agree with the transing of kids and these sorts of things. And we want to have like this larger national conversation about this. And like you mentioned earlier, we were talking about Republicans and Democrats. You know, we have to be able to find this common ground amongst each other and go back to like a common sense reality, understanding of certain things like sex and biology. Like, oh my God, God forbid. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. So one of the things I guess we can end on that I kind of wanted to ask you about is, do you think there are, and Bran, I know a couple, but trans people who are like allied with this cause of ours, who actually, they agree with us and they, they want to, I don't want to say help facilitate the divorce, but they definitely want to help facilitate a restoration of a rational approach to these issues. And so yeah. it's interesting reality. Yeah. Yes, there are. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up that point. It was after that I entered the discussion that I did meet some of these people. They're followers of mine. And uh, they understand uh, that the decision that they made as, a, as an adult should not be foisted upon LGB youth. And uh, they, they've been terribly supportive. Scott Nugent, um, Miranda Yardley, Stephanie Hayden, and, and there are more. But yeah. You get the idea. Uh, there are rational trans people um, and, and uh, their allies. Yeah. I think it's just, it's an important point that we should mention here. You know, there yeah, are, we have Sarah Higdon, Sarah Higdon show, yeah. who is also a you know, trans woman, but based as fuck, you know, yeah. she's also army veteran and doesn't think that this stuff should be available for children. Well, not just that too. They, they also aren't laboring under this kind of um, delusion this delusion that they are the, actually changing that their they sex. are the exact sex right. that they are now making the efforts to appear as and they don't expect us to play this mental game with them and to like see them as exactly that perhaps they yeah, yeah. want us to like address them a certain way out of respect and this and that and those are other issues we can discuss but they don't want us to play the mental gymnastics the mental game with them they understand what they are if i can just throw in this one last thing of uh, the uh, Chris Felker went to uh, the mayor's meeting uh, last Wednesday and uh, confronted the mayor over this and asked for a statement uh, condemning the violence. And the mayor's only response was, we're looking into it. Um, and I, I don't understand how any politician worth anything cannot take a stand against violence uh, yeah. just on its face. Right. It's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, it's only one remark away from saying something like Trump did about Charlottesville. There are good people on both sides. Yeah. Um, We're it, looking it, into it. It's like, what do you need to look into? All of the footage has been out there and is out there for everyone to see, basically. And, and then the mayor brought up the fact that some um, trans people feel fear. Uh, my question to him would be, and who's expressed that fear to you? Or are you just repeating the dogma? Um, that uh, trans people are the most oppressed people in the world. They are not. They are one of the safest demographics in the world. Yes, there are tragic crimes that occur. It, they happen to people every second of every day around mm -hmm. the world. And trans people are no different in, in having that kind of exposure. But it, I'll leave you with one statistic. If you are a woman or you are a police officer, you are three times as likely to be murdered for who you are than a trans person is. Yeah. Well, they don't want to hear that. that it just makes sense because there's a lot more violence yeah. against women and cops than there is. I mean, just there's just a lot more women and cops. Than yeah, that's trans what I was going to say. So, trans is a minority. And the other thing, yeah, this, this is the thing that they love to do. They love to create this, this illusion that there's this trans genocide happening, that trans people are just being murdered left, right, and center. It's not true. There's maybe like a dozen to 20 trans people that get killed every year. Uh, there's far more women and there's far more cops and there's far more men when, dying of suicide. When I came up with it, with that statistic, it was by using uh, the information from the FBI, from uh, the uh, National Health, and from the Human Rights Campaign, and from the Transgender Law Center. And yeah. using the figures from those groups, that's how I was able to arrive at the rate of, of death. It, it has not so much to do with whether someone is a minority or ma majority. It's the rate per 100,000 of people that are killed. And 
it, it, the, the, the statistics are clear. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that's something that we have to remember. Also a big problem in the trans community, which isn't really uh, discussed, is that a lot of the times when these trans women, uh, especially trans women, are murdered, it's because they um, were not honest with the person they were trying to bed. And there's a surprise, you know, genital moment which inspires violence, which can often actually be, if, if those are the circumstances, this actually can be used as a legitimate, you know, temporary insanity defense. And people who have murdered trans women have gotten off uh, with the temporary insanity defense because they use that defense. Yeah. So well, they, they, they would say, I felt tricked. And this I is went. something yeah. that activists do. I saw Keffels doing this. Uh, Keffels is a trans woman, but uh, I saw that the, uh, saw him doing that on, on his Twitter. And, you know, encouraging trans women to not disclose their status, especially if, you know, they haven't had bottom surgery, it's very, even if they have had bottom surgery, either way, it's very dangerous for trans women, uh, especially, to pretend and, they are biological. Just, if you're not sick, you, if you're not sick. you should remember here that trans women are not killed primarily for that reason. Um, the, the, the figure that they're likeliest to die before age 35 is based on uh, twisting statistics having to do with sex workers from a city in northern Brazil. It's it's fallacious. Um, Patricia Arquette spoke about her brother and used that figure. Well, her brother died of AIDS and died in his 40s. Uh, it, it, the, the, the emotional um, uh, appeal that's made by trans people and their supporters around these figures is a false emotion, and uh, it, it's really used to gin up support. Yeah, and that's something that we've seen consistently through the left is that they tell these fabricated or exaggerated narratives in order to manipulate people into emotionally siding with them uh, in order to weaponize our natural tendencies toward compassion and empathy. And it's something we have to watch out for because they will try mm -hmm again and again and again. Most most trans people that are murdered are murdered in situations having to do with sex work or having to do with um, domestic violence, yes. not not having to do with who they are. Yeah. And then uh, that's one of the things that people don't like. You know, th th these these things are hard to hear because it's sort of like, you know, if you've been in the cult, if you've been inculcated into the church, of you know trans women are just the most the biggest oppressed minority ever it's very difficult to break out of that and to get information from outside the cult but also they'll have to address the reality of the problems of of um, rampant sex and drugs and all that stuff in the quote-unquote lgbt community because that's another thing that the gay community, community. The gay we, do, we do a lot of drugs in the gay community that is true fred was that was that common back in the day too back in like the 70s and 80s when you were a younger man or is that something that's been like a new no, no, no. no uh th th there was uh, there was a lot of street drug usage in the sex work community uh associated with the, the gay community but the, the community at large i mean if if somebody had a had a joint that was a big deal Interesting. Yeah, it seemed well because it's, now it's like New York City. I don't know the last time you were here, but like there's basically marijuana everywhere. Yeah, well, it's just like all over the city now. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's been legalized and decriminalized. Uh, but even before then, it was just very common feature of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the gay community, you know, I, I came up uh, basically. I was in my young out of crazy and gray years was pretty much like the 2000, 2002, 2005 to 2015 or so. And uh, I saw a lot of drug use, especially among the sex workers or a lot of gay uh, male sex workers who would have to uh, put needles into their privates in order to do their job. And I was just like, that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, where, where's the concern for that? You know, where's the activist concern for, you know, the gay guy that's like turning tricks in order to make his bills because, you know, and there's this sort of like weird idea that like the gays, like, you know, because we're, we are seen as these sexual creatures that, that we like that and that that's okay. And, and back in my head, I'm just like, you know, sex workers are people and they're just trying to survive. And it just blows my mind that people just like, you're like, 
you go, girl. Like, it's empowering. I'm like, no, it's degrading. <laughs> right, right. right. The, the, the falsehoods about sex work and its empowering uh, nature, it, 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 it's really just um, a, a mask that people put on a very, very bad situation. Yeah, and it's a shame, but I think I think we're gonna come out of it. I think our culture is slowly, uh, you know, we go like three steps forward, two steps back, you know, and it uh, it oscillates varyingly. But hopefully, uh, you know, as we continue to have these conversations and more gay people sort of like come out of the conservative closet, which is something that we all like, not even conservative, just like not uh, mainstream or not you know, come out standard. of the, gen the gender critical closet. The gender critical yeah. closet, yeah. <laughs> Um, now, well, this this stuff is all going to come to a head, and it already is. There are already lawsuits in the work. There are more and more D trans people every single day coming out and talking about their experiences and, and how it went wrong for them. And it's only, a, it's only a matter of many, time. Many, many of the people, not many of the people, but a, a large number of people that uh, uh, bothered to communicate with me and uh, voice their support. A number of them were D-trans people, yeah. and they they support what I'm doing, um, if only to spare some other young lesbian uh, their experience or young gay man. Yeah, yeah. it's happening across the board. It's really sad. It just it seems to get the girls more than it gets it is, the guys because it's but... a social contagion. It's the new cutting. It's the new emo phase. Except now it's, it's now it's On being steroids, backed by literally. mainstream culture and crazy cult doctors like. That's the difference. Yeah, it's, it's like bulimia. You know, it, it's, it, it's young men uh, actually don't go through that much of a change. They they don't get the surgery, and rarely take puberty blockers or hormones because they are well aware that it's going to sterilize them. Right. So the, the guys tend to leave that alone. It's the women that are being tricked into uh, the radical cosmetic surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Did you lose Fred again? We might have lost him again. Yeah, it's definitely harming women more, though. Yeah, it does seem to be affecting women more, for sure. Um, well, but then I mean, again, that's because it makes sense. Women are more susceptible to certain agents. You back, Fred? Oh, yes, we am. There we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, we were just talking about how it, it is definitely harming the girls more. I think the statistic is something like a 5,000% increase in like visits to like gender clinics or some shit in the UK. For yes, yes. over the past like few years it's like something crazy like that and a large number of them are on the autistic spectrum it's like that's that should give everyone pause and make them realize like okay this this is not natural there's something else going on there is no way that many young people have gender dysphoria it does not make any sense <laughs> or like, like when it's in a family like this the thing that kills me is yeah. when you have one trans parent and there's like multiple trans or non-binary children nope, in the family. I'm just understand. like, ah, it just makes me so want to rage. Or a friend. You know, that's, that's kind of like, um, I always compare it to a vegan cat. I mean, we know who's really in charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the vegan cat syndrome. So hopefully that event, uh, you know, we get up there and we make it very clear that, that they are the minority, that their views are harmful, and that they are the ones erasing and causing harm and spouting dangerous, quote unquote, rhetoric. Yeah. But not our brand, because our brand is cool. Not our brand. Fred, thank you so much. We really appreciate you making the time. Uh, your story is amazing. Uh, we'll let everyone know where they can find you. Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Are you on Instagram, TikTok, any of those things? Probably the best way it would be to follow me on Facebook. Um, Facebook, okay. I think I did already. Yeah, and, and I want to thank you for having me on. I, I, I think uh, the message is important, and the more people that can hear it and realize that people are trying to make a change, the better. I, 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 and I look forward to meeting you, Brent. Yes, totally. I'm very excited to to hang out with you. I think I'm really, uh, you know, I've I I didn't 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 really get to meet that many gay uh elders like people that are older than me in the gay community you know i've met a handful uh through the years i've had some very close friends uh lost one uh, my buddy robert you know, you tend to hang out with the kids you know 
<laughs> yeah, totally. It was just like you have to hang out. It's like it, it's something we, you know, for some reason, I think it's the way that we're brought up in school systems. We don't really associate with people too far beyond our age range. But I'm very excited to hear more of your stories and to follow your developments. And we will totally have you back on the show anytime you want. Um, I'm sure something else crazy is going to happen. Yeah, and maybe we can have you on it. in coordination with other people. So we can have a wider conversation. That'd be interesting. All right. Well, I guess thank you, everyone. So you can find Fred on Facebook. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Donate. Donate if you can. And we will be back soon with another one. I'm going to end the recording. Bye-bye. Later. <laughs>